Hello and welcome to the Ocean Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Silverwood. And this is episode 36 of the podcast, and it's the final episode for 2020. We'll be back in 2021 with more great podcast episodes, including a very special new series called Meet the Innovators. And the host for Meet the Innovators will be my co-founder, Nick Chiarelli, who is the brainchild of OIO, and he'll be taking a deep dive into the finalists from the Ocean Impact Pitch Fest and uncovering what it is that makes them tick, what is the ocean challenge they're trying to solve, how will the solution scale, where are they at now, and what do they need to go into the future. So stay tuned, we'll be releasing some of those episodes in late January after we take a well-deserved break. In this episode of the podcast, we're speaking with Dr. Alex Thompson, who is a researcher with the University of Technology, Sydney, and also the manager of the Deep Green Biotech Hub at the University of Technology, Sydney. Now, she's a marine ecologist, she's a superstar of STEM, but we took this opportunity to really learn about the wonderful world of algae. Algae is what makes Alex tick. She knows so much about it, and I take the opportunity to be a bit of a newbie. Alex, bring the world of algae to me and to the listeners. So if you don't know a lot about all the incredible opportunities with algae and all the opportunities around commercializing it for incredible things like climate mitigation, new medicines, new textiles, new materials, then this is the podcast for you. As we round out the year, we just want to say a big thank you to everyone who has tuned into episodes. There's 36 more of these. Go in there, have a listen, and please tell other people about it. Share it around. We think with more people listening to this podcast, we can just have a greater positive impact on planet ocean. Have a merry festive holiday season. We'll see you in 2021. Very excited to have on the podcast today, Dr. Alex Thompson, who is the manager of the Deep Green Biotech Hub at the University of Sydney. You're a lecturer there, you've done your PhD in marine ecology, you're a superstar of STEM, and you're going to tell us all about the wonderful world of algae today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. So... Uh, we are going to go and take a deep dive into this peculiar world of algae, but we'd like to start at the very beginning. So let's learn a little bit about you, um, why it is that you've become so focused on algae. And particularly, I'd love to start with, um, what does the ocean mean to you? Tell us about your relationship with the ocean and how it led to you doing what you do today. Sure. So I, I grew up in a little town, some people might know, called Coffs Harbour, um, which is an amazing place to grow up if you want to grow up around nature because it's it's just beautiful. And I grew up on a property up there and used to go to the beach almost every day. Um, I never really considered a career in the ocean or in marine biology when I was growing up. I kind of I was always interested in science and I always wanted to do something in science, but I thought it would be kind of in the more medical field. Um, because, you know, when you're growing up and, and you're in kind of a country area that's often seen as if you want to do science, you become a doctor or you become a pharmacist or something like that. I really didn't know that there were these careers out there that you could, you know, do that type of thing with, which is, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't know that there's all these types of careers out there that you can do things with. So I always grew up having a really awesome relationship. I, I liked going snorkeling quite a bit. Um, and it wasn't until I was in uni and I started, uh, I was doing a sort of a more medical focused, health focused degree. And I was like, you know what? I hate this. I hate it so much. <laughs> and I had, a, I think it was a guest lecture one day from someone. Um, I think they were talking about like global health or something. And they were saying, you know, if we don't take care of our planet, we can't take care of the people on it. And it just like something snapped in me. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, you're so right. And I had a bit of a, um, you know, as a, as a lot of 19, 20 year olds do, a bit of a kind of what am I doing with my life? You know, I've been doing this degree and none of this even matters. And I um, swapped and I started doing some environmental science subjects, which just kind of really blew my mind and then just changed my degree, changed everything that I was doing. And uh, when I started 
honours, I started working on seagrass um, and spent nine months underwater in the freezing cold waters of Port Phillip Bay, um, you know, in a in a wetsuit that was about eight mil thick, um, getting brain freeze from snorkeling for too long. And I thought, yeah, this is it. This is this is kind of really what I want to do. And it's kind of just been a bit of a bit of an addiction, I think, ever since then. Awesome. So the focus initially on seagrass. Tell us about when it sort of shifted across to focusing more on algae. And yeah, tell us a little bit more about that academic journey and how it led to where you are now. Yeah, sure. So I did my honours and my PhD work on seagrass. Um, I was really interested to kind of understand how climate change was being affected uh, by human impacts and how the ocean and, and plants around us are able to kind of help capture carbon and sort of mitigate some of those processes that are sort of going on. And so I did a lot of work in that space, trying to understand that. And when I was doing that, I kind of dipped my toe in a little bit, doing a little bit of work on, on seaweeds, um, which was really cool because seaweeds and seagrass, people sometimes think they're the same thing, but they're, they're very different. Um, but they, they both sort, serve amazing kind of functions in in, in you know, climate change and all those types of processes. I finished a work on my PhD and I was doing a bunch of teaching and uh, the, the research institute that I was working in was really um, kind of deviating into working in a lot of microalgae uh, fields. And so they were working in everything from using microalgae to make pigments for food, um, using microalgae to make different types of medicines, looking at uh, treating wastewater with microalgae. Um, and I started to get really interested and I kind of thought, you know, I've gone from researching how we can use environments to help us remediate the planet, but what if some of these things that are in these environments can actually help us to make products that are more sustainable? Um, so we're kind of coming at this issue of climate change and sustainability from sort of both sides. Um, and that became something that I was really interested in and started learning a whole lot more about and has led to me kind of managing the Deep Green Biotech Hub, which, um, you know, is really kind of empowering people to use some of those tools and build businesses and new products and services from some of the research and the work that we're doing. Great. And I'd love to come back to the uh, huge range of applications for, for algae at a later point. But um Let's take a bit of a deep dive into algae. This is this sort of beginner's guide. So <laughs> describe to us the wonderful world of algae, um, you know, some of the history, why it exists, where it is, what it does, all of that good stuff. <laughs> it, it is a big world. There is a big world of algae. Um, I, <laughs> my friends always joke to me and they just call me Dr. Algae now because it's getting to the point that, you know, if, if we're having dinner or something, the conversation more often than not switches to, to algae. They can't get me to shut up about it. But <laughs> so there are kind of two main types of algae. There's there's macroalgae, which is kelps and seaweeds and things like that. And then there's microalgae, which is tiny, single cell. You can kind of think of one cell being a complete plant. Um, so algae first appeared on our planet about two and a half billion years ago. If we kind of think about the way that our planet sort of evolved, the appearance of algae is, is really important because algae was the first thing that worked out how to turn sunlight into oxygen and photosynthesize, which it worked out that it could do so well that it actually started creating an atmosphere. So algae is the whole reason that we actually have an oxygenated atmosphere on the earth, which then meant that all the other plants and animals uh, were able to evolve much more efficiently because they could actually breathe oxygen. And even though it first evolved kind of two and a half billion years ago, it's still on Earth today. So if you kind of think about all the different organisms that have kind of appeared over the history of our planet and they've disappeared again because they've become extinct, the chance of something that it was first here two and a half billion years ago still being here today is pretty remote. So it's a pretty resilient and pretty awesome little plant. Um, so algae you know, because it kind of falls into these two categories of macroalgae and microalgae can do a bunch of different things. Um, typically, when we uh, are kind of exploring algae, we, we talk about it as it being a plant. It's not technically a plant, but it still photosynthesizes and grows really similarly to a, to a plant. And the reason why we are so interested in it, especially when it comes to things like developing new products and things like that, is because microalgae in particular grows really, really fast. You can grow it in uh, salt water, you can grow it in fresh water, you can grow it in polluted water, you can grow it in a mixture of all three. 
and it grows some really important compounds so things like oils proteins and carbohydrates so if we're thinking about hey i want to make a new plastic um you know you could grow an algae that's quite high in oil that you then use to convert it into a plastic which is you know it kind of makes sense because the way that we get petrochemicals so we make things like petrol and plastics out of is we mine them and we mine uh you know petroleum which is actually ancient algae stocks that have just been buried for billions of years and just compressed over time so why not just like stop that process grow it on the land capture some carbon in the process and make some plastic that's a little bit better for the planet I love it. Yeah, you know, I'm a bit of a, bit of a plastics guy, so yeah. <laughs> the quicker we can get to um, creating a range of compostable and biodegradable plastics instead of using um, petroleum would be very, very welcome. When we talk about the freshwater and the saltwater varieties of algae, um, did I read somewhere there's about 100,000 different types of algae? Which ones are in saltwater? Which ones are in freshwater? Talk us a little bit about that. Um so realistically we don't actually know how many species of algae there are there's i mean scientists have identified about 30,000 species we think there could be upwards of a million some people put that as about 70 100,000 but also you know especially the microalgae they're evolving so fast that one day you count 10 species the next day there could be 15 so it's kind of this really kind of that's incredible <laughs> this, isn't yeah it? <laughs> This tricky situation of trying to actually work out, you know, how many are there? Well, it's, you just start counting, you're never going to stop. Um, so obviously seaweeds and kelps, most of those are going to exist in, in your oceans and, and obviously your salt waters. There's a bunch of microalgae that exist in the ocean as well. So things like diatoms, you know, they grow like a little silica shell around the outside. Sometimes people call them kind of like glass algae, um, a really important part of marine food webs. They capture a bunch of oxygen or they produce a bunch of oxygen and capture a bunch of carbon. Um, they're really important in terms of like our ocean, what we call like a silica cycle. So the availability of silica in the ocean as well. Uh, in freshwater systems, there's a whole bunch of different microalgae, and these form a really important part of our aquatic food web. So everything from little bugs to fish will eat them. And then obviously as you kind of food web grows, they kind of form that basis of feeding a whole bunch of different things, as well as actually you know, being able to produce a whole bunch of oxygen in these environments as well. On the ocean, um, the statistic that's well peddled out there, you know, two thirds of the oxygen we breathe or every second breath um, comes from these oxygen producing microalgae. So tell us a little bit about that. Is that an accurate statement? How much of the oxygen which is sustaining life on this beautiful pale blue dot we call home is coming from the ocean and from microalgae? So, yeah, they do say that our oceans produce about half the oxygen we breathe and that's everything from seagrasses and kelps and microalgae and other kind of aquatic plants they also say that algae produces half of the oxygen so when you're kind of thinking about you know what do our what's the other stuff it's all the other plants and, and things that we have on earth they actually kind of estimate that microalgae in particular can actually produce up to 80 percent of the oxygen we breathe so it can be as much as that in some cases it's it's really really important for us to be able to um I guess, work out how much it's responsible for so that we can actually work on ways to kind of conserve and manage the ecosystem so that we can get, you know, as much oxygen as we can, as we kind of need. But as well as that, they're really important in terms of capturing carbon. So obviously we know that, you know, being able to capture carbon is really important in being able to sort of manage climate change. Um, and certainly microalgae play a really important role in that. As they grow, they're able to kind of suck in the carbon dioxide that might be kind of in the water or within the atmosphere and then convert that into more cells and then it kind of grows more and more. Can we talk a moment about um, bioluminescence? Uh, I've seen some great images emerging recently on social media showing um, incredible bioluminescence uh, on the coastline of California. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you know of, of bioluminescence in microalgae. <laughs> I don't know a huge amount about bioluminescence. Um, it's Bioluminescence in algae is is one of those things that's sort of an amazing, I want to call it a phenomenon because, I, I mean, you don't always see it. You don't know when you're going to be able to see it. I know that some bioluminescent algae are actually um, carnivorous, so they need to eat other algae in order to survive. And we, it's, it's actually really interesting because all the time people are like, can I grow bioluminescent algae in my house? Can I have it as a nightlight? Can I, can I do something with it? Which would be kind of cool. But 
it's actually really hard to keep alive outside of its natural environment, which I think is true for a lot of species. You know, we want to be able to take them and cultivate them and do something with them. But as soon as we take them out of their native environment or their natural environment, they just they don't want to borrow it. And bioluminescence is, is in algae is one of those ones that does that. It's a little bit fussy, that one. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about what you've been doing with the uh, Deep Green Biotech Hub, because when you search this online, the first thing actually you will probably start to see is these incredibly captivating images of the the growth, the vessels that you're utilising to actually grow these algal stocks. So yeah, just take us a little bit through what it is that you're doing with UTS and the, and the Biotech Hub, um, how it started and where it's heading. Yeah, so... The Deep Green Biotech Hub was founded about four years ago. Um, it kind of came about because the research institute that I sit within called the Climate Change Cluster was doing a whole bunch of work in microalgae and kind of saw that, hey, to grow this kind of sustainable bioeconomy industry in Australia, we need to be able to give these tools to people to kind of, you know, help small businesses, help startups utilise this type of work that we're doing. So I came on board a couple of years ago and we kind of saw that there was a need, first of all, to help uh, give resources to startups and small businesses to do exactly that. So we created the Green Light Accelerator Program, which is uh, something that we're able to help startups and small businesses. We put them through a cohort-based program, seed funding. They get a research mentor and they're able to basically go from a concept to a prototype in about five months. And the thing that they all have in common is that they're all working with algae. Um, so some of the teams have worked with seaweeds, some of them are working with microalgae, and they're doing a whole range of things from making new cosmetics uh, to building kelp farms. Um, some of them are making new ways of growing algae. So the, the things that we grow algae in are called bioreactors, and there's a bunch of different ways that um, those can be built, but some people are making different types of ones to put in your own home or to be more efficient at growing different types of algae. Uh, we've even worked with people to make different types of algae food. So it's been a really, really successful program. It's been running for about 18 months now. And we've had 10 teams go through. And what we've seen is just, you know, the diversity in businesses that are kind of starting to use algae is really, really growing. And the types of sort of innovative ideas that people are having are really kind of, for me, I think as a scientist, you kind of do all this work and you kind of see the potential of something. But to have people who are invested and want to make a business um, to make you know, the types of products and services that we use every day more sustainable is is really kind of inspiring. Yeah, that's certainly why, uh, from OIO's perspective, we are so passionate about the work that you're doing. So tell us a little bit about this, um, the bioeconomy for algae, what it's projected to be, where it's at now, what it's going to take to, to grow the sector. Yeah, so it's... Um, in places like America, France, Hungary, it's quite advanced. Um, you know, in places overseas and in Florida, for instance, they have big algae ponds that sit next to um, like, a, like a power plant that then captures the carbon that comes out of that power plant, grows algae using that carbon, and then the algae is then used as chicken feed. So rather than having a waste product that could contribute to climate change, that is then used to grow something that, you know, is, is potentially uh, reducing and maybe a less sustainable supply chain. There's also companies in the States that are making everything from algae-based surfboards, you know, making a biodegradable foam, uh, algae thongs, um, alternate meats using algae. Um, I've had algae mayonnaise. I've had algae popcorn. <laughs> so it's kind of because it's such a versatile resource, the applications and the industries that it can have an impact on are really broad. And certainly in places overseas, we're seeing that there is a really big interest and a really big growth in this kind of industry. In Australia, we're still getting there, and certainly that's one of the reasons why the Deep Green Biotech Hub exists, is to try and help uh, boost the availability and the resources that are out there for companies that are interested in working in this space, but also to kind of reach out and educate people about, you know, exactly that conversation we just had. What is algae and why are you talking to me about it? And why is it important? And why should I be eating it or putting it on my feet or putting it on my face? So certainly, you know, I think, we're seeing that this industry has really big potential. I think it was projected to be worth about four billion US dollars by 2024, uh, with a growth that we're sort of seeing as almost exponential. You know, especially in places like alternate proteins and and new apparel, as we kind of um, 
you know, there's been lots of kind of new stories on fast fashion and, and how can we reduce the carbon emissions and, and certainly things like microplastics from fast fashion, you know, is there space that we can have alternate um, sources of, of, you know, supply chain or, or uh, compensating for carbon emissions in, in those types of spaces? Um, you know, I think we're going to see that this type of algae bioeconomy is going to grow and certainly the potential, I think, in Australia is, is massive. Yep, and we're going to do our little bit to help you as best we can. <laughs> so talk a little bit about some of, those, some of those solutions that you have been working with through the Greenlight Accelerator, um, the 10 teams, the three cohorts that you've been through. Give us a bit of a glimpse into some of the, um, some of the solutions and ideas that are emerging. Yeah, so the first cohort, we had a really diverse team, a group of teams. So we had um, Sea Health, who are a kelp farming team down from the south coast. So they uh, were working on developing their kelp farm a little bit more. We're working with a brewery to develop some new products. And we were working with um, a startup who wanted to start growing some microalgae for fertilizer um so if we're thinking about diversity of products like that's that's pretty much as diverse as you could possibly get um our second cohort again was was really diverse and we we kind of worked again with some more some more kelp teams um we worked with a company that were developing new um like face products and sort of personal care products out of algae who have done a little bit of a pivot into some hand sanitizers to kind of compensate for some of the COVID shortages and some teams that were looking at new ways of sort of growing algae. So new kind of like I spoke about those sort of bioreactors ways that you can kind of grow algae. Um, and then this cohort is we're looking at algae food. We've got an education program and uh, the other team is looking at algae for fashion. So, again, I mean, if you're wanting to kind of think about the scope and the diversity of kind of applications, I think that almost kind of speaks for itself. We've got everything from fashion to food to, um, you know, new ways of growing algae. It's kind of, it's pretty amazing. Do you have any challenges in trying to fill the pipeline of people interested in the Accelerator program? Is there a lot of people out there in this space hungry to work in, in, in algae? There are. We get inquiries from, uh, you know, every from the UK to the US for people wanting to be a part of the program. We're the only uh, algae accelerator program on the planet currently. Um, I hope we get some more soon because honestly, it, it would be amazing to have more people working in this space. Um, we are currently uh, accept applicants from across New South Wales, so we try to support teams that are regional and rural based, as well as based around Sydney. Um, so, I mean, in terms of filling the pipeline, it, at the moment, we don't have a shortage because it's, it's. I think people are really sitting in this space where they are really inspired and they see it started to become this thing of like, you know, that responsibility of one, like, what can I do to contribute to the, the betterment of the planet and the future of the planet? And people are starting to act on that in terms of how can I make this a part of my career or how can I make this a side project that actually has a difference? And one of the ways that people do that is, of course, you know, starting new businesses. Um, so I think that's it's been an amazing almost um, shift in the types of people that are approaching us to be a part of the program. It's, it's I'm going to take responsibility and I want to do something that makes the planet a better place. I think you deserve massive congratulations for that process because not only have you provided the structure and the support to run these brilliant programs, you're doing the inspiration piece really well. And I think this is a great little prelude to some of those public-facing activations that you've been doing, Vivid Sydney, Splendour in the Grass. I mean, these are big, big public events and activities. So tell us a little bit about that, some of those ones specifically with Vivid and with um, Splendour in the Grass. Yeah, so Vivid, Vivid was an amazing project and I cannot claim really much credit for that because that was a team of about 100 people <laughs> that put that together um, and I really kind of came in at, at sort of the midway mark to sort of help out. But in terms of the engagement that we had from that, it was phenomenal. So what we did for Vivid in 2018 was we built a an installation uh, which was made up of a bunch of sort of really long tubes that were lit up because it's vivid and they contained living algae and there was a couple of different species that it contained and that sat in circular key for um, three or four weeks and what was really exciting about that I think it was for a lot of people their first experience with 
something that was, first of all, it's something we had taken straight from our labs and put on the streets of Sydney, which I don't think a lot of people, um, you know, was was super, you know, familiar with. We'd grown all that algae in our labs. Um, our culture technicians had worked, you know, making sure that everything was, you know, beautiful and all the algae was happy. But also talking to people about, you know, how much oxygen that installation was producing while it was down there in Circular Quay, I think it was producing as much oxygen as like a suburban park would in a year. So if you think about the number of trees you might have in a suburban park, you know, 20 to 30, it was pumping out as much oxygen in those three weeks as, as one of those parks would in a year. And I think for a lot of people, it was kind of this point of like, oh, wow, like this is a pretty important part of, of the planet. Um, so that was a really, really kind of it was so interesting because, the, you know, people, I think it started that kind of piece of like, wow, what can I do with this? What can me, you know, a person that works in a hospital or works in a paint shop, what can I do with this and how can I become involved? Um, and then Splendour in the Grass was last year and we, we used the same installation but in slightly a different way um, and then had uh, we built something called the Deep Green Forest, which was a tent that sat alongside and people could come in and um, we got them to breathe carbon dioxide into bags and then grow algae using their own breath um, and then people were kind of you know really kind of engaging with algae in a, in a really kind of intimate way but it was really exciting to kind of see how people were so engaged and then we grew we went up I think with 400 litres of algae but because it was so warm we thought the algae would die like normally if it's up there for for that long and we're not in a lab, it kind of starts to decline. But because it was so warm, we actually doubled the amount of algae that we had over the three days. And we ended up with about 800 litres of algae, <laughs> which uh, we then gave back to Slender because the type of algae that we were using is actually perfect for plant fertiliser. So they were able to use it on the, their bush regeneration that they had up there on their site. So um, in terms of like it was just so great and I mean young people are so excited and inspired about sustainability and, and what they can do and we really saw that in action um, up there at Splendour. Another project that I saw get a great deal of media attention last year was the collaboration with Young Henry's that are a, an independent brewing company from Sydney. Tell us a little bit about that particular um, collaboration and, and how well that went on the media front. Yeah, sure. So that is a research collaboration with the um, research institute I sit within, the Climate Change Cluster, and that was a really kind of research intensive project. It was working out, you know, how can we grow algae in a brewery, which as far as we know had never been done before. Um, how can we use the brewery waste, so the carbon dioxide that a brewery is producing, to potentially grow algae, um, and and how all that kind of process works. So we were able to grow a bunch of algae in the brewery. It actually grows beautifully in the brewery. <laughs> and uh, we, again, you know, the ox because we, they were actually growing a fair bit of algae, they were growing like nearly a ton at, at any one time. Um, the amount of oxygen that was producing was equivalent to about a hectare of bush, um, which... <laughs> in a suburban brewery in the back yeah. streets of Sydney is not a yeah. bad outcome. <laughs> yeah, not bad at all. So, I mean, it was really, it's a pilot scale. It's The purpose of the project was to work out, is this going to work? And now the ne kind of next stages are, okay, let's, let's do this more efficiently. Let's do this bigger. Let's work out what we can sort of do next. But in terms of a, a collaboration, it's, it's an amazing space to be working in. You know, again, working with these businesses that are really wanting to make a difference and, you know, it's it's a big kind of leap for any business to take you know someone that's doing something completely different to I want to make my business more sustainable is one leap but then taking a risk on something that has never been done before is you know is another really big leap and working with companies that want to do that is is really kind of amazing that had amazing traction in the media I think it kind of came at a time where people were getting really disheartened with um, a lot of things that were happening in terms of sustainability and climate change. It came at a time that we had been experiencing the worst bushfire season that Australia had ever experienced on top of the worst drought that, you know, we'd had for nearly 100 years. Um, and it came at a time that I think people were really kind of cottoned on to, hey, we can do something. We as people can make a difference um, to our planet and to climate change. This is a small brewery sitting in the middle of Sydney that's doing something really, really different and potentially can have a massive impact, not only on their own industry and their own business, but, you know, wider, just inspiring people, I think. Um, I think we ran some numbers on that and more than a million people globally saw that story, which 
is is yeah phenomenal. Yeah, and I think the images also help as well when there's bioreactors sitting in amongst the vats in a brewery, blowing you know glowing green, looking like they're brewing some sort of Frankenstein in there or something. Yeah, and that, it got featured in a Guy Sebastian video. Um, right. Yeah, <laughs> it does look very, very sci-fi. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just they are some of the best people I've ever worked with because they are just so passionate about what they do, and they're so passionate about making their industry more sustainable. Which, I mean, as a scientist, you know, to see people taking that type of action, it just kind of like it makes you feel better about doing the work that you're doing. Yeah, and fitting right in with our, our mission of, of good business to create an abundant and sustainable planet ocean. We've spoken quite a bit about applications. I wouldn't mind just sort of focusing on one. We spoke about plastics and, and using the oils and proteins in algae to replace petrochemicals. What about fuel and humanity's absolute reliance at the moment on fossil fuels for our energy, transportation, etc.? What role could, um, could, could algae play in addressing our, our, our fuel needs? Yeah, so I said earlier, you know, a lot of the petrochemical that we currently extract from the earth is just microalgae that's been compressed for a really long time. And then, you know, just like you make diamonds through pressure, you make oil through algae. Um, and, you know, there was a really big interest about 10 years ago, can we just use microalgae just to make straight oil to run our cars and, you know, in particular planes because they take a different type of fuel that is particularly, you know, carbon emitting. And there was a really big boom and a really big interest in trying to get this done as quickly as possible. Um, and it was almost like a bit of a, a race, you know, who could do it the fastest, who could make it the cheapest, who could do it the most efficiently. Um, that's died back a little bit, but it has really been the precursor of all these other products that have kind of emerged off the back of it. I think it's something that's still quietly ticking away, and I think we'll probably see algae fuel in the next sort of 10 years. But I think really what has been the, the major concern with algae biofuel is making it as competitive as current fuel. You know, you want to make it as cheap, as easy it as easy to get and as efficient as current fuel. Um, and that has been the kind of, uh, uh, you know, as well with plastics, you want to make it as cheap and as easy to manufacture as everything else. Um, that has been the thing that people have been working away on is making sure that it is as cheap as, as um, the fuel that we currently use, because in order to make it, you know, swappable, you have to make it um, as equal to in as many ways as you can. Hmm. Yeah. And here we are in, May 2020, and we've seen the oil price go through the floor in recent times. So <laughs> that's going to make it very hard for commercial enterprises starting up to try and be cost competitive with petroleum. It'll it'll get there, I think. Um, I think that it's you know you see people are starting to make different decisions about the products that they buy. Um, you know. I constantly talk to people about well, I can't make a difference because you know my vote doesn't count. Well realistically every single time you buy something you're voting you know you're voting to choose that product you're voting to choose that service and I think if more people understand or are empowered with that every time they spend money they're essentially voting for something they're voting for a particular practice they're buying a product that contains palm oil that's voting for that practice they're voting for um, using a particular type of petrochemical that's you know if we and but people are changing the way that they do that you know they're willing to spend a little bit more money to ensure that the product that they're buying is more sustainable that the supply chain is sustainable that the uh, the product is um compostable then you know we're starting to see that maybe these products that might be a little bit more expensive because they're a little bit more expensive to manufacture might stand a chance and outcompete some of the stuff that isn't you know as sustainable yeah, very good call to action for everyone tuning in to vote with your wallet and be <laughs> conscious about the impact of your purchases. I'd love to talk a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, about um, the role of, of women in STEM and what you have seen in recent years and where it's sort of heading. Tell us a little bit about, and also the fact that you're a, a superstar of STEM. What does that mean? Tell a little bit of people <laughs> about that. So Superstars of STEM are a group of women. Uh, it's a cohort run through something called Science and Technology Australia. And the whole kind of purpose about it is to boost um, the presence of women in, in media and, and just people getting more kind of interface the fact that there are so many women working in STEM across Australia, but we're not always familiar with the women that are working in STEM. Um, I It's something I get really, really passionate about because I, I think 
I work with so many women working in science, you know, and they're doing such amazing things, but we don't necessarily hear about it. And I mean, it is a bit of a systematic problem. We don't always know what people are working with in science, but in particular, there are so many amazing women who are working in science. Um, I, I mean, I have, I was so, so lucky when I was growing up, I had a bunch of female science teachers. So I kind of always just saw like science is for everyone, but that's, that's not always the case. I think a lot of people don't necessarily see that there are women working in in STEM um, and I think it's really important to showcase that there are women working in a whole bunch of different fields across STEM and and um, we're out here changing the world <laughs> um, and you know it's it's not just women working in you know biology or ecology there's women working in technology and engineering and a whole bunch of women working in mathematics um, I, I am really passionate about that girls know that there's more careers out there than, you know, what they think might be out there in their bubbles. Certainly where I grew up, I, I, you know, as I kind of started this conversation, I thought in science you just had to be a doctor or a pharmacist, that there wasn't necessarily all these kind of different careers out there. And I think one of the things that I always talk to high school students about when I talk to them is the thing I got told in high school was the career that you, you know, you'll eventually end up with doesn't exist today. And I was just sitting there like, oh, yeah, whatever, they're just telling me that. But it's really true. Like the job that I have didn't exist like four years ago. Like just didn't exist anywhere, you know. And um, I think if you can imagine the type of job that you want, it, you can kind of do it. And whether or not you are male, female, or other, just it shouldn't be a barrier to doing the. Yeah, I love that, and I think um, yeah, it's just so brilliant that that structure exists for you, and you've been able to create this incredible platform um, to share that. So we have spoken about a great deal here. Is there anything that you've had uh, an interest in talking about that we haven't come up about yet? Maybe it's about where you're at now and what the future looks like. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Um, we've covered a lot, haven't we? We have. <laughs> we've done a great job. In 30 minutes, we've covered a lot. Um. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just excited about the future. I think the more I talk to people about, I, I mean, algae is one tool that we can use to make the planet more sustainable. There's certainly so many more out there. I think what we're seeing is that there is a really fantastic future for our planet to be more green. Um, I think now is the time as well. I think we've seen, you know, what happens when we all take a global action against something. And I think it, we can see that global action is possible um, and our next big fight is going to be climate change and what are going to be the things that we activate and the things that we use, the tools that we use to fight that. I think we're starting to see what they are. There might be algae, there might be other things, there might be other ways, there might be other people, but I think what's the thing that I'm trying to take about this whole kind of situation of everyone being at home and things changing so fast is that, you know, as, as a global community, we can activate things and see real change. Um, so let's, you know, use this as a precursor to take on our, our next fight, which is against climate change. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to be you know, right there by your side. Maybe we can wind up the conversation today, Alex, with just a bit of um, information on where people can go to find out more information about you and about your work. Yeah, sure. So you can visit the Deep Green Biotech Hub at UTS. So it's deepgreenhub.uts.edu.au. We've got a whole bunch of educational resources. Um, you can book a robotic tour of our labs. You can book a session, a one-on-one -on -one session with a scientist, and you can learn more about our Green Light Accelerator program. If you want to learn more about me, just uh, look me up on Twitter and, and Instagram. Both of them, drat, Dr. A.T. underscore science. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Keep up the excellent work and uh, we look forward to supporting in any way we can to see a flourishing algal bioeconomy in Australia and beyond. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks.